Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, The John Campia Show. And I'm, of course, your host, John Campia. And let's just jump into it right off the top. We're starting today off with this. For those of you fans of the CW stuff, Mark Guggenheim has been like the showrunner of a lot of stuff going on there, including the showrunner for Arrow. And in the last year or two, he's, he's been the co-showrunner of Arrow. But it looks like he is now stepping away both as the showrunner for Arrow and as the showrunner for Legends of Tomorrow. And Beth Schwartz, who has been a writer on Arrow since season one, she went on to become a co-producer. And this past season, she's been a co-executive producer of the show. She is now going to be the showrunner for the next season of Arrow. Now, I think Guggenheim did a great job getting this whole thing going and off the ground. But you guys know if I have not been super satisfied with where Arrow has been for the last couple of seasons. It looks like, if you take the last few episodes of Arrow, it looks like they have learned, they're learning that, hey, yeah, we've made some mistakes the last few years. We need to get back to those core elements that used to make this show so special and so good. And it looks like maybe they're heading back in that direction, fingers crossed. And maybe Guggenheim and the rest of them just thought, you know what, we need some new blood as showrunners in here. And they got in a brand new showrunner. So I think that's great. For those of you interested in the CW stuff, look at that. Also, there's going to be a new showrunner. The person who was acting as co-showrunner on Legends of Tomorrow with Guggenheim is now going to be the exclusive showrunner over there as well. So a little bit of shakeup stuff going on with the CW shows. Now let's talk about this. You guys know that I am a Movie Pass subscriber, and I like using my Movie Pass card. However, uh, as I've pointed out quite a bit, Movie Pass as a company acts kind of shady. Uh, they've pulled some underhanded stuff and acted pretty shady uh, in many ways. In, in many, and I'm not even sure how long this company can exist. There's a new article that's going around through the major trades today talking about the situation that they're in and how the movie industry itself really doesn't look at movie pass all that favorably. The Variety actually quoted one particular source, a studio representative, saying that movie pass was a quote unquote cancer on the industry, pretty negatively. Now, another quote was also given to us by Tom Bernard, the co-founder of Sony Pictures Classics. And what Tom said was this, he goes, everybody's happy to take their money right now, talking about MoviePass. Everyone's happy to take MoviePass's money right now, but I don't see that as something that's going to continue. I'm concerned that to recoup their cash, they're gonna to try to work some type of deal with theaters where my cut of the box office, talking from the studio's point of view, is going to be diminished. Herein lies the main problem I've always had with Movie Pass's business strategy. And Tom Bernard kind of sums it up pretty well. I've always said that Movie Pass was lying to everybody. When Movie Pass says, we're going to make our money through data analytics, and we're going to make our money through consumer information, and we're going to make our money through this, this, this. And I've been saying for years, that is not their plan. Their plan is to try to strong arm movie theaters and force movie theaters to cut them deals where they get discounts on the tickets, they get a, a portion of the concession stand prices, and in recent months, we've seen movie pass tip their hand. They've basically tipped their hand, that that's really what they're doing. Now, what we're seeing from the other point of view here, let's look at this comment again, because I want to analyze this a little bit and point out one of the big problems here. Tom Bernard, co-founder of Sony, and I believe his attitude represents a lot of attitudes from people in this business. He says this, everyone is happy to take movie passes money right now, but I don't see that as something that's going to continue. Okay, first part right there, that's been a big concern. A big concern in the industry is that movie pass, what they're doing, they can't continue doing it for long. They're simply going to run out of money. You know, when I spend... 10 bucks for a movie pass a month, but I'm buying about $70 worth of movie tickets a month. That is not a good business model. And so far, major theater chains like AMC and Regal have not decided to bend to movie passes will. So there's a big concern out there that this model that they've set up, this $10 a month model is going to go away and it's going to leave consumers disgruntled. But anyway, here's where another problem comes into play here, though. And it's not MoviePass's fault. The second part here. I'm concerned, the co-founder of Sony Pictures Classic says, I'm concerned that to recoup their cash, they're going to try to work out some type of deal with the theaters where my cut of the box office is going to be diminished. Okay, let me be very clear about something here. 
While on the one hand, I don't agree with movie passes underhanded, lying, deceitful, and strong-arming tactics about having a business plan that pretty much involves trying to strong-arm other companies to play ball with them or else. I've never agreed with that. I mean, if they had at least been open about that from the beginning. If movie passes just come out from the beginning and say, hey, look, here's our strategy. We're going to amass a large user base and make movies more accessible for the people again on a $10 a month scale. And we are hoping, our, our goal here is to show the movie industry, look how many millions of users we have. It is in your best interest, movie theaters, to cut, get into a deal with us. Like if they had been open and honest about it, I'd have much less of a problem. But here's where the other side of the problem comes. And this is the problem from the industry. All right? Let's read that last part of Tom's comment again. My concern is that to recoup their cash, they're going to try to work out some sort of deal with theaters where my cut of the box office gets diminished. Herein lies a major problem in this industry right now. Everybody is so concerned about keeping their slice of the pie that they're completely ignoring the fact that the pie is disappearing. The pie is disappearing. And everybody in this industry, from studio reps and movie theater chains and everybody else, everybody's so concerned about making sure nobody gets a piece of their pie, that their piece of the pie needs to stay intact. They're so concerned about that, that they're completely ignoring the fact that the pie is disappearing. I understand a studio exec wanting to say, hey, I am concerned about somebody taking my cut of the box office. That's great, but you're ignoring the fact that fewer and fewer people are going to the movies. You're so desperate to hold on to your cut of the box office, what kind of cut of the box office are you going to have left when there's no more box office? And there's a systemic problem here that I've been talking about for years in this business, about studios, their spending being way out of control, costs for people to go to the movies is completely ridiculous and out of control, and all this stuff is resulting in fewer and fewer people going to the movies. Yes, the industry has tried to camouflage that and compensate for that with higher prices and luxury seating and all that kind of stuff. Many of these moves were very good moves, but all they're doing is camouflaging the fact and saying, oh, look, this was the biggest year at the box office so far. Maybe, but fewer people went to the movies this far, and that's not sustainable. You can't sustain yourself by, oh, less people are coming? Well, then let's get more money out of the people that are coming. And then next year, oh, now even fewer people are coming? Well, let's get more money out of the people that are still coming. Hence, turning more of them off so next year, even fewer, they're going to come back. That's not sustainable. And while I agree with part of Tom's comment there about the overall concern about movie pass, he tips his hand showing that their big concern is about keeping our piece of the pie. Instead of stepping back, looking at the big picture and realizing, you know what, our industry, which is a classic industry, it's a strong industry, it's a great industry, but our industry is vulnerable right now. And we've got fewer and fewer people coming to the theaters. And we need to become less concerned about keeping our piece of the pie and maybe be willing to shave off a little bit of our piece of the pie in order for the pie itself to grow. You know, maybe instead of being so concerned about your little piece of the puzzle, maybe you should cut away a little piece of your puzzle so the grander puzzle can be healthier. Maybe instead of worrying so much about my little part of the industry, I got to keep it when the industry itself is dying. They've got to change their tune as well. So you got two sides. You got like a movie pass that is acting kind of underhanded and shady. And then you got an industry that is acting greedy and completely myopic and refusing to see the big picture of things. When you've got some solutions here for some problems, if both sides of this equation took their heads out of their collective asses and tried to change the industry and make it better for everybody, maybe if they did that, Maybe if they did that, we could see some really good things start to happen in this industry as far as consumers go. When you got a service like MoviePass, Cinemia, and stuff like that, and you got a great creative industry, if both sides would just get their heads out of their asses, maybe they could come to some understanding, they could come to some deals, make it great for the audience again, make the consumers want to come back to the movie theaters and give us some good deals in this, maybe then you'd have a healthier industry. Maybe then. 
but it's gonna take collective jackasses like the heads of these studios and these movie pass people to get over themselves and start seeing the bigger picture. And if that can happen, we might get some really good stuff here. We've got the potential for some really good stuff, so I hope that can happen. Anyway, sorry, I got a little bit worked up about that. Uh, listen, before we go into our main topics today, when you watch the John Campion Show, I want to make sure you're caught up to date on everything significant going on in the world of movie news, even if we don't have time to go in-depth into them. So this is a little segment that we put together for you guys that we simply call the Movie News Feed. First up, one of the best animated franchises in the last 10 years or so has been the DreamWorks series How to Train Your Dragon. A third installment is on the way, and now we have the official title. How to Train Your Dragon 3 will officially be called how to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World. The first How to Train Your Dragon film released in 2010 and made just under 500 million at the box office, while the sequel came out in 2014 and took in over 620 million. The third installment was initially slated to come out in 2016, but that was pushed back to 2019 and now is set to be released on March 1st, 2019. Next up, according to reports, Warner Brothers has taken its next step in putting together a DC-based film, Birds of Prey, which is set to star Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn once again. Warner Brothers has selected director Kathy Yan to direct the film, making her the second female director in the DCEU, along with Wonder Woman's Patty Jenkins, and the very first Asian woman to direct a superhero film. From Deadline, the project is based on Birds of Prey, which in the DC Universe teams Harley Quinn with several other female crime fighters, namely Black Canary, Barbara Gordon, also known as Batgirl, and Huntress. Although it should be mentioned that it hasn't been confirmed if all of them or any of them will be characters in the new film. Margot Robbie is also attached as a producer on the project. The DCEU seems to announce new projects and directors and writers all the time with little to show for it, so it'll be interesting to see if this one actually gets in front of the cameras or not. Next up, A24 has just released a new trailer for their upcoming horror film, Hereditary, and it is every bit as freaky as the last one. From Dark Horizon, Hereditary is currently one of the best reviewed films of the year of any genre, getting rave reactions at Sundance. The story follows a family who unravels cryptic and increasingly terrifying secrets about their ancestry. The more they discover, the more they find themselves trying to outrun the sinister fate they seem to have inherited. Hereditary is slated for a wide release on June 8th. Next, the Jason Manzalkis and Tony Revolori road comedy, The Long Dumb Road, has just been acquired by the Universal Pictures Home Entertainment Content Group. Manzalkis is best known for his incredible work in that great comedy series, The League, while Revolori was seen in The Grand Budapest Hotel, and more recently as Flash in Spider-Man Homecoming and Dope. From Variety, the film made its world premiere at the 2018 Sundance Film Festival. Revolori plays a college-bound teenager who offers a 30-something mechanic, Menzaukis, a ride during a stopover in small-town Texas. As they travel through the American Southwest, both passengers become alive through the possibilities of the open road as they find connection, comfort, and chaos in their shared journey. Next up, online movie ticketing company Adam Tickets is stretching beyond just selling movie tickets. Their app now allows you to pre-order your concession snacks in advance and to have it waiting for you when you arrive at your theater. Currently, the Adam app allows moviegoers to pre-order concessions at participating exhibitors at the time they purchase a movie ticket, with about one in three Adam users taking advantage of it. With the new feature, moviegoers will receive an alert on their smartphone as they get closer to the theater or movie time, giving them a second chance to order concessions through the app for quick pickup at the counter. This enhanced functionality was validated by a recent study by Adam Tickets of domestic movie ticket purchasers, which found that 52% of respondents said that long lines was the number one reason they sometimes skip the concession stand. The study also found that 50% of moviegoers would buy more often and buy more items if they could pre-order. And honestly, if they found a way for me just to walk into a theater and go directly to a counter to get my food, count me in. There are a lot of times I skip the snacks just because I look at the line and it looks way too long. And finally, Focus Features has just released the first official poster for their incredible looking upcoming documentary, 
Won't You Be My Neighbor? Won't You Be My Neighbor takes an intimate look at America's favorite neighbor, Mr. Fred Rogers. A portrait of a man whom we all think we know, this documentary is an emotional and moving film that takes you beyond zip-up cardigans and the land of make-believe and into the heart of a creative genius who inspired generations of children with compassion and limitless imagination. The film is set to hit theaters on June 8th. And that'll do it for today's installment of the Movie News Feed. And now you are all caught up to date on everything going on in the world of movie news. Now let's get into our main topics for discussion here. And by the way, the main topics of discussion are topics and questions that you guys send in to me. How do you send in a topic or a discussion for The John Campus Show? It's simple. You just email me anytime at john at thejohncampusshow.com. Put that word topic in the subject line. And as always, guys, keep the emails to 90 words or less. All right, let's get things going here with the first main topic today. And this one comes to us from our Patreon supporter, John Nicola, who writes, Last week, it was announced that uh, Natalie Rias and Gabriel Luna were joining the new Terminator film. However, in the Hollywood Reporter report, it stated Linda Hamilton and Arnold Schwarzenegger are reprising their roles, but sources say that their parts are relatively brief. Isn't this, you know, rather disappointing? <laughs> uh, yeah, it does sound disappointing, if true. I don't think starring roles should be expected, but at least a Han Solo Force Awakens level part, there were significant screen time was still shared. Your thoughts. Okay, so yeah, of course, we've found out about some more cast members joining the upcoming Terminator film, and I am begrudgingly slowly starting to get a little bit excited about it. But you're right, I saw that same report. In that report was this seemingly little throwaway line that Linda Hamilton and Schwarzenegger, while they're going to be in the movie, that their roles are going to be brief. Like, it didn't say they're going to be relatively small roles, because that's fine. I guess I could get I don't expect Arnold to be on screen for, you know, 90 out of the 110 minutes of a movie. I didn't expect Linda Hamilton to be in, you know, three quarters of the movie. It would have been another thing if it said, you know, they're going to co-star in the film. Okay, get that too. The report said that their appearances are going to be relatively brief. And I got to tell you, I mean, again, look, we don't know a lot about the movie at this point, but one of the things that has gotten me interested in this new Terminator film is that we got Arnold and Linda both back, that it is a direct sequel to Terminator 2, ignoring Terminators 3, 4, Genesis, and whatever else comes after it. It's just a direct sequel to Terminator 2. That's pretty nifty too. But the fact that they're getting Linda Hamilton and Arnold back together again, that is a big reason, one of the big reasons, not the only reason, but one of the significant reasons that I have gotten more interested in this project than I was before. And yeah, it was. it's funny because you'd think something like that would have been a headline, but it wasn't. It was just this minor little throwaway line in the story. Roles are going to be relatively brief. So, a couple different ways we can look at this. Number one, um, they're not really all that brief. Maybe it was just bad wording. Maybe what they meant to say, it's like, hey, they're not the major stars of the film. Like, these films are going to be led by a new cast, but they're going to be there. And it just kind of came across the wrong way. Maybe using the phrase relatively brief, which kind of feels like it's a cameo. Maybe it was just a bad choice of words. So I'm willing to go with that, that maybe it's just a bad choice of words because you'd think finding out that Linda Hamilton and Schwarzenegger are like barely going to have something beyond a cameo role in the movies. You'd figure that would be a headline somewhere. You'd figure that would have been a big story. So I'm willing to go with the idea that maybe it was just bad wording. On the other hand, maybe it's true. Maybe Arnold's in like three scenes. Maybe Linda Hamilton is pops in in one scene, says something and disappears. I, I mean, I simply don't know at this point. I, I'll say this. I'm not going to get too worked up as a fan over one little throwaway line in a report that may or may not mean what it looks like it means. So I'm not going to get too worked up over it. I will say this. If it does turn out that Hamilton and Schwarzenegger just have minor, small little roles, like just a little bit above a cameo, I'll be disappointed. If that's the case, I will be disappointed. But again, let's not get too ahead of ourselves when we really don't know what it could have meant. So let's see one until more information comes out about this. All right, next question. The next one today comes to us from another Patreon supporter, William Siggery, who writes, it's official. 
with Ready Player One going over the $500 million mark this weekend, Steven Spielberg is officially the first director ever to cross the $10 billion mark for all of his films combined. I just thought I should highlight this incredible feat Great work and bring on the filthy. Well, thank you so much, William. And uh, yeah, this was a little piece of news that came up a few days ago. Very quietly, just kind of came and went. But with Ready Player One, which by the way, it's nice seeing it get to 500 million because with, with the relatively disappointing opening weekend it had, I had my doubts that Ready Player One would get to 500. I mean, really, it, I would like to see it at 700 plus, but hey, at least at 500, it's making money. Anyway, with Ready Player One getting to 500 million, Steven Spielberg is now the only, I mean, he was already the all-time box office leading director of all time, but now he's the first director ever to have his combined directorial films reach $10 billion, which is just crazy. But really, when you think about it, I mean, look at the movies this guy has done, whether it's Jaws or E.T. or Close Encounters of the Third Time or Indiana Jones movies and on and on and on the list goes. This guy has just made, he's the best filmmaker of all time. He's done every conceivable genre from fantasy, adventure, period piece, uh, biopics, you know, uh, like you name it, he's done it. And now he's even done a film like Ready Player One. It's just incredible. And, and you're right, it's just another kind of explanation point on the incredible career that this guy's had. And he still has like another, at least 10 years of directing in front of him still. He's still a relatively young guy. I think he might be in his 70s now. I'm not really sure. Hold on a second. Let me, how old is Steven Spielberg? Let me look that up. How old is Steven? You'd think I would know this, um, but I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, he's 71. That's right. He just recently got to his 70s. So he's got like another easy 10 years in front of him of directing before he, he retires. So it's just another great explanation point on the incredible career he's had and yet another reason why he's like my favorite director of all time. All right, let's move on now to the final emailed in question today and then we'll go over and take some live questions. And the final email question today comes to us from Skix who writes, in the past week or so, you have constantly stated your prediction of how much Solo a Star Wars movie will make, which is about $100 million, which you say would be a successful outcome. With the reshoots, isn't the budget somewhere near $350 million, about double the original two hundred? How is that not a Justice League situation? Wouldn't Solo need to make one hundred and forty to one hundred and fifty million opening weekend to be successful? All right, thanks a lot for the for the email skicks. And look, you're right. One of the things this is Solo is in a little bit of a Justice League situation. It is. You had a movie, and then a whole ton of it had to be reshot, and those reshoots are not free. Those aren't free reshoots. So now you're in a little bit of a situation like Justice League. I mean, Justice League would have been pretty profitable if it wasn't for the fact that its budget went over $300 million by the time all the reshoots were done. From what I'm hearing is that's roughly around where the Solo probably ended up spending as well, was around $300 million for the production of this film. That's counting the reshoots, which is ridiculously expensive. But hey, that's what happens when you reshoot a whole ton, a whole ton of your movie. The budget gets inflated and goes way out of control. Okay, so it's roughly in the same situation as Justice League was. But here's the thing. How much money it makes opening weekend really isn't the thing about whether or not the film can be successful. And to be successful, you at least got to break even. Like Justice League was very lucky. Justice League crossed that line. It got into the break even territory. So Justice League was fortunate in that way. It's not about opening weekend numbers. It's about the final tally. See, Solo can make 150 million opening weekend, but still only end up making 480 million overall when it's all said and done. If that's the case, then it loses money. All right, and there's just no getting around that. If it, if it makes $480 million, that film loses Disney a lot of money and Disney is not in the business of losing money. It's really more in a position like Justice League where it needs to make about 650 to $700 million. And really, if it makes $100 million opening weekend and then goes on worldwide to make $700 million, then it's totally fine. Like, I, I've been saying that for a while. I do not think Solo is going to be a billion-dollar film. I just don't. I think it's going to be like a $700 million film, and that's okay. A $700 million film makes it a profitable movie, and that's totally great. 
But the opening weekend number really isn't the big thing. I mean, look, it, the bigger the opening weekend, the better it is for Solo, for sure. But you can open to $100 million and still reach the $700 million mark. Yeah, you can. That's totally doable. So it's really not, once again, it's not about how much it makes in its opening weekend. It's about what's its overall take going to be. And really, that's the bottom line with that. Anyway, that's just my thought on all that. Okay, guys, we've got about uh, 10 or 12 minutes left here, so I want to go over and take some of your live questions that you guys have been firing in, for those of you who are watching live. And we're going to start off the live questions with Tyler Bateman, who writes, Forget you and the John Campia show. We want the Ann Campia show. Well, I can understand. She's certainly smarter. Uh, she's certainly more better to look at than me. Uh, no doubt about that. She's got far more charisma than I do. Unfortunately for you and me, though, Anne has a career. And she has a full-time job. Yeah, I would actually love to have Anne on more. As a matter of fact, I can tell you this. Saturday the uh, 28th, April 28th, when I do my spoiler review, my live open chat spoiler review for Avengers Infinity War, and that gives you guys plenty of time to see the movie. You've got Thursday night to see it. you got Friday that you can see it. you got Saturday matinees so you can see it. So later Saturday afternoon, early evening, uh, Pacific Coast time, I'm going to be doing my review. Anne Campia is going to be joining me for that. So Anne's going to be sitting here right beside me because she's going to actually see the movie more than I am. By the time we do that review, she's going to have seen the film four times. Uh, and I will have probably seen it twice by then. But she will have seen it four times by then. She's got opening night, she's got the premiere, she's got a Hasbro screening, and then she's got another screening with a friend. So she's going to have seen it four times by the time that that comes around. So Ann Campia will be joining me. So uh, celebration time, Tyler. Ann's going to be with me on Saturday the 28th. Uh, Josh Crichton writes, I'm ready for a Master of Disguise reboot. Ma the Dana Carvey movie? Remember the tur turtle? Turtle? The... Oh my God, that movie was so bad. And I am a huge Dana Carvey fan. Like, I, I love that dude. Hold on a second, let me just look up something up about it. I'm thinking of the right film, right? Yeah, yeah I'm, think, I'm totally thinking of the right film. Um, and I didn't know, I didn't know if I should laugh or be offended about how badly he was impersonating Italians in that movie. Like, I love that dude. And I thought that movie was, oh my God, just brutal. But the turtle scene... The turtle scene is is chuckleable. If, if it wasn't for the rest of the movie being so bad, maybe the turtle scene would be a little bit more iconic. But uh, yeah, turtle, turtle. Anyway, uh, I'm going to be doing that for the rest of the week now. Thanks a lot, Josh. Uh, Adam Douglas writes, do items splattering on a lens pull you out of a film? Thank you, Adam. Yes. It, it, it does bother me. I know some, I don't know why some directors feel like, oh, it's like if you're in a race scene, that you should have the splatter from the mud and the water go up and go onto the lens. Unless it's Deadpool, I'm not supposed to, I'm a movie viewer. You're not supposed to remind me that I am watching a movie. You're supposed to immerse me in the movie. And you're right, I hate that. I don't mind it in real life sports, but when in a movie, in a narrative movie, when they splash stuff on the lens and you can see the stuff on the lens, thank you so much for just reminding me that this is fake stuff happening in front of a camera. Now, of course, I know that, but I want to be able to suspend my disbelief for two hours while I'm watching your movie. And whenever that happens, I don't want to make a bigger deal out of it than it is, but whenever that happens, it does. It pulls me out of the film. It's like a slap in the face reminder. By the way, guys, all this stuff on screen is all fake and this is all happening in front of a lens and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yes, I know that, but I want to suspend disbelief for two hours and get immersed in your movie. Thank you for pointing that out, Adam. Yes, that does drive me crazy whenever that happens. It's not the worst thing in the world by any stretch of imagination, but it does. It does pull me out of the film every time that happens. Uh, Dakota Barber writes, Favorite Lord of the Rings movie, mine is Return of the King, an incredible finale to an amazing trilogy, and the end gets me every time. Dude, listen, that scene when Strider gets down as the king, you know, first of all, when the hobbits start to bow and he stands them up and then he kneels. Dudes, can you see the can you see the bumps on my arm? I'm just thinking about this. Can you see the, the hair on my arm standing up and the bumps on my arm? It's seriously all there. And then he kneels, the king of men, kneeling to these four little hobbits saying, my friends, you bow to no... It's happening again. Look at it. All over my arm. I'm getting chills just thinking about it. You bow to no one. Oh. Oh, are you kidding me? Oh. 
So good. So good. This is one of the best movie moments ever. That movement, I love it. Anyway, yes, I, I, I kind of cheat in that when I think of Lord of the Rings, I think of it all as one big film. And that's cheating a bit. But if you're specifically asking me which is my favorite of the three, it is Return of the King. Um, probably the single greatest achievement in filmmaking history is that one film. I'm not saying it's the best film of all time, but when you consider all the different disciplines that go into making that one movie, it is the most incredible achievement ever. It, ha it holds the record for the most Academy Award wins out of every film. No film in history has ever won more Academy Awards than Lord of the Rings Return of the King. None. And it swept. It won 11 Oscars, including Best Picture, and it won for every single category it was nominated for. It was a complete sweep. Uh, and yes, so Return of the King for me is, is my personal favorite. Uh, let's see here. Josh Crichton writes, got a shirt idea. For those who are about to support John Campia, uh, he salutes you. Uh, get the parody. On the back says, action, let it roll with you behind the camera. Um, for those who are about to support you, so a little bit of a Spartacus thing, for those who are about to die, we salute you. That's a very good play on the term there. That's a really good call out to the film. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, Miles Pardo writes, thoughts on David Lean's Ryan's daughter. I, I, I'll be a minute to you right now. I'm not familiar with it. I'm not familiar with it. Sorry about that. Uh, Josh Crichton follows up. Over under 25%, the rumored Ryan Johnson trilogy features Chiss and Yuzang Vong based on the leaked information that came and it's called Edge of the Unknown. I, I'm going to take the under on that. I don't, I don't believe that's the case at all. I've never heard anything from Lucasfilm. Um, now, Chiss is one thing. Chiss is both in the legend stuff and is canon because we've got Grand Admiral Thrawn. And in the novel Thrawn, they go a little bit into the Chiss. And as a matter of fact, one of the main characters of the book at the end of the Thrawn novel, he goes out and joins with the Chiss Ascendancy. I kind of love the name of their, their, their like, I don't know if that's the name of their military. They call it the Chiss Ascendancy. That's just cool. That's a cool name for a club. Anyway, um, and in Thrawn, the novel, they do talk about greater threats. That are out there. Now, some people who read Thrawn and read those little subtle suggestions that there are greater threats out there, a lot of us who are aware of the legend stuff, immediately we may think of the Yuuzhan Vong, right? The threat that came from beyond the Outer Rim, that like kind of gnarled alien race, you know, that, that was coming. While you could make an argument that the stuff that is mentioned in the Thrawn novel could suggest them. I haven't heard of anything else coming out of Lucasfilm that suggests that they were going to incorporate the Uzen Vong into canon. That doesn't mean they won't. That doesn't mean they're not going to. I'm just saying I haven't heard anything about that. So my guess is even if they're looking at story possibilities with the Chiss and the Vong and all that kind of stuff, I have my doubts that that's Ryan Johnson's project. I think Ryan Johnson's probably just going to be writing something completely original. So I'm going to take the under on 25%, but it's certainly something for us to keep our eyes on. Definitely. Uh, Digoto One writes, have you seen either Hush? Yes. Or Gerald's Game? Yes. Both Netflix movies uh, directed by Flanagan. Both are really good. Uh, I'll disagree with you on Hush. I'll disagree with you on Hush. I, I, I was not impressed with Hush. Uh, Gerald's Game was quite good. Uh, I was really happy. And Bruce Greenwood... I'm a big Bruce Greenwood fan, so I've always appreciated and really liked his work. Um, so I did enjoy that one. It was kind of a, I like movies that make you go, what the hell do you do? Like I was kind of, I really like movies that kind of put you as an audience member in that position and Gerald's Game did that. So again, I'll disagree with you on Hush, but I'll agree with you on Gerald's Game for sure. Um, Kenneth Bravo writes, will we see a Quiet Place sequel slash spinoff? Well, look, when you look at the success that Quiet Place is having, obviously you start thinking in terms of sequel, right? You start thinking in terms of sequel or spinoff or whatever. But Quiet Place, the things that make Quiet Place special, my fear is this, you do a sequel or a spinoff or a prequel, you're going, yeah, you can use the name Quiet Place, but now you are going to break the spirit of what it was because all there's left to do is to get into the flashy, monster movie grr, and quiet place what made it so brilliant was that it was not a monster movie at all there were monsters in it that had nothing to do with monsters it was about a family 
and it was about love and sacrifice and and devotion and what you would do for your kids and it's about pain and survival and season on top of that some pretty cool looking monsters that did some pretty nasty things but as hard it's not a monster movie here's my fear my fear is you do a spinoff it's a monster movie spinoff and then it loses its heart so this is going to be one of those rare occasions because I'm usually like all for any kind of a sequel or spinoff if you want. Quiet Place to me, it's like you captured lightning in a bottle with it and did something really special with it. And I just don't see how you can maintain that in a sequel or a spinoff at all without it becoming a different kind of movie. And that doesn't interest me. I'm kind of hoping they just let it uh, let it be as it is. Um, let's see. Styler Manu writes, I'm enjoying Lost in Space on Netflix. I think that Toby Stevens, a good Brit, who plays John Robbins, is underused. Uh, you didn't mention his performance in your review. What are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, so I did a review for Lost in Space. You can find it on my YouTube channel or just search YouTube Lost in Space Netflix review. I, I think mine will come up near the top. You'll see it no problem. The basic gist of it is this. I thought it was a good show. I thought it was a good first season. But it didn't come anywhere near its potential. I think it's worth checking out. I think if somebody asks me, hey, John, should I watch Lost in Space? I'll say, yeah, get, I think you should check it out. Keep your expectations in check because it's not great. It's not great. It's got several problems. It doesn't reach its potential. It starts to touch on really cool things, but doesn't explore them and doesn't really go into them. And it stays rather shallow. But it sets itself up nicely for things it could do in a second season where hopefully they can improve upon that. One of the guys that makes it good, first of all, I liked all the cast, and that includes uh, Toby Stevens, who plays the dad, John uh, John Robinson. He was quite good in it. Um, I think the, the, the reason I, he kind of gets overlooked is because of how good Molly Parker is. Uh, Mar Molly Parker, as the mom, she's really kind of the center of the show. And she was so good in it. And definitely, Toby Stevens is great in it, too. And the kid actors are great. So, yeah, I thought Toby was quite strong. I thought he was quite strong in it, to be honest with you. Uh, Griffin Campbell writes, Over under 30%, the Boba Fett makes a cameo in Solo. Also, are you for or against that idea? Love the content. You the man, John. Sending love from Oregon. Well, thank you so much, Griffin. Really appreciate that. You know, there's a lot of people who are just stone cold convinced that Boba Fett is going to show up in this solo movie. I'm actually one of the few guys that I don't think he will. I have no insider knowledge of that. I have no idea if he is or not. My guess is, though, is that he's not. That's my guess. So I'm guessing he doesn't. So I'm going to take the under on that. And I am also against it. There's no need. Look, Boba Fett only started to cross paths with Han because of the bounty on his head by Jabba the Hutt. And that hasn't happened yet. So there's just no need to have Boba Fett in the movie. Again, one of my criticisms of Lucasfilm is that they're continually seem to be shrinking the universe instead of expanding it. Throwing Boba Fett in there just for the sake of having him in there is just going to be shrinking the universe again. So I, I really hope they don't do it. Uh, Styler Manu 1 writes, Slave 1 appeared in a solo TV spot. Have you seen it? That was not, that was not Slave 1. That was just a random, um, that was a random piece of debris or meteor or whatever, or, um, yeah, it was space rock or debris. It wasn't, um, I do not believe for a second that that was, uh, Slave One. I could see why, because for those of you who haven't seen it, they're in the spot as the Millennium Falcon is flying through the clouds, uh, the space clouds, and the TIE Fire is chasing him. There's a whole bunch of debris flying by, and one such big piece of chunk rock flies by, and if you kind of do an outline of it i could see why hey man that kind of looks like the slave one but not that it's actually the slave one so i don't think it is now watch we're gonna go watch solo and it's totally slave one that's possible but no i i looked at it i saw it it's like nah that ain't slave one that's just a that's just a rock it's just a rock spinning out of out of frame there's nothing there that indicates it's actually slave one from my point of view at any rate all right, just got a few minutes left here, guys. The number Thor writes, thoughts on the Maze Runner movies? You know what? I actually thought the first one was pretty good. I like the first run Maze Runner. I mean, it's not great, but I thought there were some really cool things they did with that first Maze Runner movie, and it made me interested in the sequel. It, the rest are garbage. I, I, not, I, I don't find anything redeemable. I'm sure if I had to sit down and think of redeemable things, I could find redeemable things. All, even the worst of movies, have some redeemable qualities, but... I did not like the follow-up films at all. 
And it's really too bad because I thought the first one got them off to a pretty strong start. I like the first one, but yeah, the rest of them I didn't dig. Uh, Thor falls up. Better Robocop movie. One, two, or three. Oh, that's easy for me. Maybe that might be a little bit difficult and tricky for some people. For me, it's no problem. No questions asked. Robocop 1. I love Robocop 1. The, there, there are merits to the other ones as well. But for me, Robocop is, yeah, is, yeah, Robocop 1. And then uh, one more time, number Thor writes, In A New Hope, when we see Han owes money to Jabba from a few jobs, so they already knew each other. So over under 30%, we see Jabba pop up in Solo. Actually, no, it wasn't for a few jobs. There was one job in particular. Solo was smuggling, smuggling spice for Jabba, ran into an Imperial blockade, and Han jettisoned Jabba's contraband. He jettisoned Jabba's property. That did not go over. Hence the thing, hey, well, yeah, you can't blame me. Like, even I get stopped sometimes. And not everybody dumps their thing in the first sign of trouble. So anyway, so there was one particular thing, and that was the inciting incident that had Jabba put a, a, a bounty on his head. That had not happened yet. Solo hadn't yet become the smuggler that he was. Like, we see that in the trailers, that, hey, if you join this life, you're never going to get out of it. That's in the trailer. He hasn't been in there yet. Again, to me... Having Jabba in there is pointless. It would be gratuitous at best, and it would just once again be shrinking the universe that they should be expanding at this point. So I'm going to take the under that Jabba shows up, and I really hope he doesn't. It's possible. It's also very possible Boba Fett could show up, but I'm going to take the under on both of those numbers. All right. Uh, Rose Ryan just sends in a super chat to support the show. Thank you so much, Rose. Uh, Warren Lucas writes, Hey, John. Could the big box office winner this summer be Mission Impossible 6? Last one made close to $700 million and the August release looks very weak this year. Your thoughts? Um, see, I, I don't think so. Because I think... First of all, I think Deadpool is going to make over $700 million. I think uh, Solo has a chance of getting over $700 million. I don't see MI6 getting much over $700 million, So I'm going to guess no. But it's not inconce inconceivable. It's not inconceivable. It's not inconceivable. You know, all the talk is going on about Deadpool. Look, Infinity War is a summer movie. I don't care if it opened a few days earlier. It's, it's basically it's a summer movie, but whatever. If you don't want to count Infinity War, fine. But everybody's other attention is then focused on Deadpool and Solo. And for good reason. But MI6. People, those trailers have been bonkers good. Like, bonkers good the trailers for that um the the franchise has been doing very strong the last number of films it's not a bad thing to propose i mean it's it's gonna be in it's it's gonna be close i think it'll be close i still think it'll be deadpool 2 but it could be close all right uh two more questions then we're gonna call it a day uh this one comes to us from geo who writes better ensemble cast the office or parks and oh or parks and rec you know what i'll go I'll go Parks and Rec. I'm going to go Parks and Rec. The overall ensemble cast was just really too strong. Now, if you had to put the Michael Scott character against... Um, oh, why am I forgetting the name of the lead character? Um, nope. Against Leslie Nope. I take Michael Scott. Even your secondary character, like a Jim, I take a Jim or over whoever you'd count as the secondary character in Parks and Rec. But as the overall ensemble goes... I'll actually go with uh, the overall ensemble is great in the office too. Wonderful in the office. But I think the overall ensemble in Parks and Rec is even just a little bit better. So I'll, I'll go with that one. I'm sure that's gonna, that could spark a lot of debate right there. And the final one today comes to us from Flick Talk who writes, when, Dis when the Disney slash Fox deal is done, will X slash Fantastic Four movies use ILM for visual effects? Worst part about Fox films is the CGI. In Apocalypse and Kingsman 2, the CGI is horrible. I mean, who knows? There, there's a whole ton of visual effects companies out there. It's not just about who do you use, but even which visual effects company is available right now. Look, sometimes studios will want to go to a certain visual effects company, and they give them their timeline, and that visual effects company has to say, sorry, we actually have no production availability. Our, our pipelines are filled 
at that point. So they move on and go to, and they put out tenures and bids to another company and stuff like that. That happens sometimes. So it's not always just up to them to decide. Even Disney itself sometimes probably can't use Industrial Light and Magic or not, can't use them as much as they would like to. That's quite often why in these big, big visual effects movies, you watch them, there'll be like 30 different visual effects companies listed. Um, and so maybe they can, maybe, you know, ILM can do a certain amount, but we can't do too much and we like, split it up, all that kind of stuff. But I mean, it really all depends from film to film. So it's hard to say at this point. All right, guys, for those of you who sent in live questions that I'm not getting around to, a little bit later tonight and tomorrow morning, I've got two companion videos coming because, of course, the companion video that I was supposed to put up early this morning, I recorded it last night, only to discover afterwards that I didn't turn my mic on. Hello, I had it set to this, so I was... Blah, blah, blah. It was just a whole hour of no, no sound because I forgot to turn the mic on. So I've got to get caught up on those questions and these ones too. So I've got two companion videos coming, one later tonight, one tomorrow. If your question, you sent in a live question that you can see right here or below and it didn't get answered, don't worry, it will get answered in one of those companion videos. Hey guys, listen, do me a favor. While you guys are here, if you enjoy the John Campier programming, do me a favor. I would really appreciate it if you took a moment and headed over to www.patreon.com slash John Campia. There you'll get all the information about what it means to be a Patreon supporter, how being a Patreon supporter keeps this show on the air, and third, what benefits there are to being a Patreon supporter, like having exclusive access to audio-only podcasts, an amazing Facebook group that I read every single day with our Patreon supporter members. They have a great film fan community in there. It's a really great positive place to be, as well as some behind-the-scenes videos and other things like that. Just, anyway, just go check that out. And if you want to become a Patreon supporter, that would be awesome. And if you don't, that's totally fine. I'm just glad you're here being a film fan with us. All right, guys, that will do it for me for today's installment of the John Campy Show. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is John Campy, and until the next video, bye bye <laughs>